We've been traveling through a book of the Bible um, off and on for a, for a few months, and then we had a break, and then we're back uh, to finish it. And then uh, through my adoption leave, we did some chapters in advance, and now we're coming back. What is that book? It is indeed, and it uh, essentially means matters concerning the Levites, the people that are meant to lead uh, the people of God in worship, and how to approach Him, and how to come to Him His way. But do we remember any of the sacrifices in the first five chapters? Of course. Anybody? Without looking, let's go. Uh, not in the first five chapters, but it is, there's a mention of the wave offering. How strange that you would wave a piece of meat before the Lord. Interesting. Come and talk to me afterwards. Okay? Yeah? Any others? Go on. Uh, oh, not the fire offering, but fire does do something to things. The burnt offering. Yes, absolutely. Oh, almost hit the child in the head. I'll try harder next time. Um, Yes, we, we could keep on the peace offering, your fellowship offering, the grain offering. Um, sometimes things have different names, like the sin offering or the purification offering. Very important distinction, especially when we're talking about menstruation. Uh, you remember this? Because we covered it as we covered a lot of ground uh, last time. If you don't know what I've just said, again, let's have a coffee about it. Because Leviticus is unembarrassed um, to reveal to us the symbols um, that point to God. I'm going to ask you some more questions, of course. Um, there were some priests at the top that God ordained. Who were they? Give me some names. Book of Exodus. Most famous stammering figure. Yes, I'll take a whisper. Yeah, you got that. It was Moses. And Moses' two sons were killed by God. God for being irreverent in his presence. They were called, in chapter 10, oh, I beg your pardon, Aaron's sons. Just testing whether you're awake. <laughs> Just testing whether you're awake. Aaron's sons were called? <laughs> that is correct. Nadab and Abihu. There we go. Ooh, here's a, here's a big one. Oh, there we go. Wow, intercepted by the older brother. He will repent. Don't worry. And tonight, we come to think about a slightly different theme in the book of Leviticus. Of course, it is feasts, festivals. So I've got more, is that okay? Anybody got a heart condition? I should have asked before. <laughs> Everyone is still okay. We do have lots of doctors in the church membership. But when we think about celebration, we will see that in Leviticus chapter 23, these feasts, these festivals, appointed, organized, mandated, commanded by God, point to something that is key about God's loving, faithful, saving character. So, think about when you celebrate something like a birthday. It's a special celebration time, hopefully. Um, not if you're a Jehovah's Witness, you don't celebrate birthdays, but that's none of you here this evening. What do you talk about on your birthday? Perhaps you might want to ask Andy and Sarah. <laughs> yeah, talk about your presence, yeah. Um, that was my son, if you do not know. Uh, what do you talk about in an anniversary celebration? Okay. We might ponder where we've come from. We will later talk about rhetorical questions, son. We will teach you about this. Um, we count our blessings. We talk about uh, where God has brought us from and how we're here today and the people that we have become, the gifts and characters, those around us that blessed us. Now, we are thinking here how each feast in the worship calendar that God has mandated shows something about His saving character that makes His people grateful, eternally grateful. We're going to talk about how each feast is a bit of a shadow of the salvation that we find when Jesus comes. For example, the Passover lamb met the angel of death, passed over the firstborn son of each house that believed. The lamb of God arriving means God's righteous wrath passes over any who trust in him. So they don't have God's eternal punishment, but instead are embraced by his love. So in other words, we're going to see that although we don't celebrate 
as ancient Near Eastern Israelites did, by the letter, we celebrate everything that Jesus has accomplished that this points to. Are you still with me so far? Do you need another party popper? So let's think about how it's time to worship. Time to worship. Look at those first two verses again with me of chapter 23. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, These are my appointed festivals, the appointed festivals of the Lord, which you are to proclaim as sacred assemblies. How do you fit worship around your daily routine? When is it time to worship for you. And even if you are not yet a Christian here this evening, or you worship something, because our hearts, as John Calvin says, are idol factories. We worship something, whether it's our bodies, or whether it's sexuality, whether it's money or academic achievement, we worship something. Where does it fit in your day? Maybe, like me, you might like to listen or play worship music that sings the truth of God's word. Maybe you like to listen to it being read by someone in an app, especially if you're memorizing a verse. Maybe you like to take notes in a journal Bible with wide margins. When we see a pointed time, we ought to understand God has said, it is good for you to set aside time to worship me. It is good for you to set aside time to worship me. Let's hear that same call that the ancient Israelites were hearing. Before we talk about each of the feasts, notice a few things with me as you glance at the page. It's more than something practical, these feasts. Like, for example, you think about the Sabbath and you get time off. Time off is good, right? Those of you who are retired, every day is time off. I'm joking. It's time off for other people to fill in your timetable, isn't it? So it's more than practical. It's going to be an opportunity for teaching. We're going to see that in a moment. You're going to notice the feasts are organized around the number. Number for completion. Number seven. There are seven feasts here that we will talk about. The, the, not only seven feasts, but the seventh day is the Sabbath. That multiples of seven will refer to other feasts. Like the Feast of Weeks, you wait 49 days, and then on the 50th, Pentecost. And then the 50th year, after 49 years, it's the year of release, the Jubilee, where all debts are forgiven. This was, as it still is, very against the culture, very countercultural. I actually get quite upset when I notice that supermarkets, for example, change their working hours because it's Sunday. Because I think, you have no right. You're not a believer. If you're not a Christian, you must work. We will rest. Don't miss the point. These are symbols. Think about how in those first two verses, God appointed or fixed, depending on your translation, times. Just as much as in creation, he fixed where the sun goes, where the moon goes, how far the waves come and go in the book of Job. So he also fixes that I must be worshipped, he says. We're not making this up. It's not our idea to worship God. It is good for us to connect with him. So it's kind of like this. Do you think that last Tuesday, which was Andy and Sarah Bruins' uh, 25th anniversary, last Tuesday, was that a day that you loved each other more? <laughs> it's a trick question, isn't it? Of course not. It was a day perhaps set apart for their kids to serve them in special ways, no doubt. Bring them breakfast in bed, all that kind of stuff, because they're good children. It didn't, it didn't mean they loved each other more, but that special fixed time and occasion highlighted something that was already there. That's how we are to see these festivals. Faith already existing in the God of Israel. And therefore, when we read verse 7, do no regular work because you are going to leave space and room for God to paint a picture for you to meditate on, for you to rest in. So let's talk about the Sabbath, which means to cease or to rest. Uh, has anybody ever heard of perhaps uh, some athlete who would claim to be a Christian and then not run 
or do their sport on a, sa on, on a Saturday? Yeah? Eric Little is a good example. Yeah? Some of you who are younger are thinking, who? Um, <laughs> Google it a little bit later. Yes, kind of like that picture, there may be something very unusual and countercultural about the Sabbath. But I'm going to suggest to you that as we read this, it isn't just about not working for your God, but actually taking a break from your efforts to appreciate his efforts. So it's a picture of a pattern of life with God. Because did God need to rest? Did God get tired in Genesis chapter 2, verse 2, when it said he rested? No. But it says he rested because it's a symbol of what he would want his people to do to rest in him. Other nations didn't do this. Instead, they based their calendars around maybe agricultural seasons or lunar, the lunar calendar. But here, resting on God is going to be very different to resting on your efforts. We're going to see how this connects with Jesus. So imagine, imagine that you had been rescued from 24-7 slavery in Egypt into a place where you now not, no, are no longer exploited, but you actually have a rest which other nations don't provide. What would you think about every Sabbath? You would think about how you're rescued. You would see pagan nations working for their gods that they can never please because they can never do enough, and you would go, my God has rescued me. You can begin to see how this points to Jesus. You are sitting here receiving your weekly reminder of what the Lord Jesus has done for you. Go to Matthew chapter 11 with me, verse 28. How beautiful this verse. So here Jesus says, Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus says, if you come to me, weary, burdened, aware of your imperfections, of your character flaws, of your sin, of how you can't do enough, of how um, as a spouse you can't do enough, as a son, as a daughter, um, how as a friend you can never fulfill all of the loving obligations you can for an intimate friendship, come to me and I will give you rest. This is the great difference between Christianity and other religions, isn't it? Jesus has said this at the end of Matthew 11. In Matthew chapter 12, what does he say? He is the Lord of the Sabbath. Other religions would then talk about how you initiate stuff. You do something. You do something and Allah will love you. You do something and then perhaps the universe will align around what you're doing because you've proved yourself. And then Jesus comes along and says, ain't nothing you can do. You can try all you want to rest in money, romance, skill, family, but true peace, shalom, where everything is ordered in its place, can only come if you rest in me and I give you my easy, light burden on you. G.K. Chesterton, the famous Catholic um, thinker and philosopher, was reputed to have received a question uh, from a newspaper for his opinion, for him to comment on. And the question was, Dear Mr. Chesterton, what is wrong with the world? And he simply sent a letter back saying, Dear sir, me. That should be how we come to Jesus. We look at the Sabbath and we go, I rest on Jesus. And then something happens. Something happens when Jesus comes along that some people argue that even in Leviticus it was foreshadowed. Look at Leviticus chapter 9 and verse 1 with me. The priests are ordained in chapter 8, and then in chapter 9, we're going to start the ministry. How does it begin? Verse 1, on the eighth day, Moses summoned Aaron and his sons, and then he begins 
to inaugurate the ministry of the priesthood. You look at chapter 12, verse 3, and we see a baby boy. On the eighth day, the boy is to be circumcised. A symbol of the covenant, a symbol of membership into God's people. There are other verses, like in Leviticus chapter 14. The sacrifices that you perform, that you offer, after you've been cleared from a skin disease, happen on the eighth day. Jesus rose again after the Sabbath. A new covenant in place. We Christians now celebrate here on a Sunday, not by not doing work, but by resting together in the work that Jesus has done, knowing we do not have to impress God. Time to worship means God has fixed times for us to worship Him. Time to worship points to our need to stop, stop, and think and meditate and celebrate God's salvation. It's not going to happen naturally. If you don't make time, it's not going to happen naturally. Now, let's now talk about times to worship and see how many feasts we might get through. Okay? Now imagine, if you could have a party, so you've got unlimited money, imagine here for a second that you are um, as rich as some of our elders, and you can throw a party for every good thing that you believe God has done. How many days of the year would you throw a party? Every day. Every day. Yes, a birthday you might celebrate once a year, and you think about where you've come from, and, you know, this far God has helped me and blessed me. An anniversary is going to celebrate the enduring nature of that relationship. If God has enabled you to open up a business, you're going to inaugurate it. And what are you going to say as you cut the tape? If you're that old-fashioned, it's in anticipation of things to come. Let's see what the Feast of Passover is going to celebrate in Christ. Kids, help me. Let's go. What's going on here? Passover. What's happening? Let's go. They're being told off. Ooh, they're being told off. Um, the people of God are coming to Pharaoh, and they are saying, the Lord says we must travel three days into the wilderness to worship our God. And Pharaoh said? He said no. But God, of course, was going to send plagues to show he meant business because the people of God were being treated as slaves. So God was going to rescue his people, and he sent plagues. The first plague was? Water turned into blood. The second plague. Then? Then? So we had flies as well. And we had plague on the livestock. Then? Then? Still Pharaoh said, each of those times, God gave him a chance. And? And? And finally angel of death would come and unless you had expressed your faith and trust in the God of Israel by killing a lamb instead of your child dying and painting the doors with blood you would not be rescued if you hadn't done it the Israelites were going to retell relive recap this story verse 5 at twilight on the 14th day of the first month Nisan having done none of their regular occupations. Do you ever have in your family story time, remembrance time? I know some of you do because I know some of you will have said, remember that time dad stepped on a frog? That's what one of your families told me. Remember that time dad got chased by Welsh cows that turned out to be bulls? And you, and you relive it, don't you? And you experience it and you share it. Remember that time that we lost three-year-old Esther only to find her paddling in the Thames? And you relive it and you celebrate it. 
celebrate that she's still alive, I suppose, if you like her. <laughs> Read with me. Of course we like her. She's lovely. You have to be Satan not to like her. Exodus chapter 12 reminds us and says this, Obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you as he promised, observe this ceremony. And when your child asks you, what does this mean to you? Then tell them, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. Then the people bowed down and worshipped. The children of God, as they celebrated this feast of Passover, celebrated his rescue. Perhaps even they laughed at the misfortune of the Egyptians who thought their God was a joke. We do the same. Paul says, get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch. We'll talk about that as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. God made him who had no sin to be seen for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So we look at this and we go, Lord Jesus, I'm so grateful that by trusting in your sacrifice, I will not die. A spiritual death of being in hell separated from you forever, I will be with you. There's much more that we could say. I could tell you how each of uh, the elements we see in the Passover have a parallel with Jesus. A male lamb and Jesus is the lamb of God how the, the priest was closely inspecting the lamb to make sure it was unblemished and no broken bones, and lo and behold, so was Jesus, unblemished, perfect in his morality. And even at the cross, his bones were not broken. How the blood of the firstborn uh, male lamb meant they did not die, and so the blood of Jesus means we will not die a spiritual death of being separated from God forever. Even today, as... Uh, uh, Jewish nations, Jewish peoples um, celebrate this. They leave, as you remember from when Igal was here celebrating the Passover with us, a little something for the prophet Elijah to come. Well, Elijah has come, John the Baptist, and pointed to Jesus. I hope I've been able to show you these verses aren't just about something for the ancient Near Eastern Israelites in the wilderness, but for us to be grateful to our great God. So let's talk about bread. What is it that changes when you're in a hurry? What changes about your mindset when you're in a hurry? For example, um, I arrived at a, at a gym and I planned to have a shower there after my workout. I was in a hurry. Brought no pants. No pants. That's a predicament. Being in a hurry, that's a predicament. If you want to know what happened, come and chat to me afterwards. You ever been to the supermarket without a list? Yeah? Some of you ever gone upstairs in a hurry? What have you gone there to get? No idea. No idea. Poor Matthew, look, he's only young. Already fits into this category. Some of you left for school with your kids, no backpacks. Some of you left church, no kids. <laughs> that was some of you. The Feast of Unleavened Bread has a lot to do with being in a hurry. Being in a hurry. The Feast of Unleavened Bread celebrates the reason Israel needed to be in a hurry, to be delivered from slavery. There was no time to gather things, much like evacuation procedures in a world war. On the day that Germany invaded Poland, um, children were evacuated in Britain, and uh, one such child, Ronald McGill, was sent away from his home in 1939, age nine, and it says here, holding the hand of his younger seven-year-old sister with little more than a toothbrush and a spare pair of shorts. There was no time. He was in a hurry. He just needed to escape. He needed to act, to trust that this was the right thing to do. And so the Israelites, no time 
to wait for bread to rise and make proper provisions. No, quickly make something and go. So the day after Passover, the 15th day, they celebrated their rescue from slavery. Can you imagine for a second, those who had been evacuated from their homes, perhaps with nothing but a suitcase to their name, when it was all said and done, and they looked at said suitcase again, and it was time to pack after years and go back home, or what was left of home, how would they have felt? They'd arrived, took their suitcase away, they look at it again, how would they have felt? Imagine the Israelites, after not being slaves, talking about their rescue in a hurry, but total salvation. Even today, Jewish families would celebrate that leaven is a picture of sin, and you want to get rid of it. And the celebration of this feast involved the head of the household searching a house with a candle. There's a kit you can buy, £2.99 on eBay, in case you are planning to celebrate it the Jewish way today. And you're going to hold a candle because it's God's word shedding a light on sin because you're trying to find this yeast around the house. You're going to use a goose feather for sweeping the crumbs onto a wooden spoon. I don't know how many hands you need for this activity. And it's a wooden spoon because that's a picture of sin, so you burn it. What is this a picture of? Jewish family seeking to get rid of sin on their own. Look at what Jesus says. Be on your guard against the yeast. Yeast, a picture of hypocrisy. Again, we read, Paul says, get rid of the old yeast so that you may be an unleavened batch, new life with Christ. Here's the big difference. Unlike Jewish families celebrating the Feast of Unleavened Bread today, you and I have to acknowledge our moral bankruptcy. We can't do it. We can't get rid of our sin. It's so hard. I had not realized that even as a Christian saved by grace through faith in Jesus, nothing of my own accord, I had fallen into living my life as if I have strength on my own. Do you know how I was reminded of this? Because when I adopted two children, I quickly found I am not as patient as I thought I was. I am not as self-controlled as I thought I was. I have to apologize to a six-year-old boy for losing my temper. I cannot get rid of the yeast in my life, of the sin, of the hypocrisy, of the failure. We celebrate now as Christians that not only can Jesus overcome the sin in our lives, forgive it, but there's a whole project he has started, a project of sanctification that you and I look forward to, not ourselves cleaning the yeast in the house, but Jesus one day being finished with it no more evil desires, no more perverted desires in our hearts and minds, uh, no more need for self-control because we simply do what is right. We are like Jesus. And if you look at this feast, you as a Christian ought to be excited, excited that one day in the new heavens and the new earth, you will not have those evil desires anymore. So, we speak of the Sabbath, God's rhythm of worship. We speak of the Passover or the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Let's finish this evening talking about first fruits, the festival of first fruits. Do you remember, if you do, tell the person next to you, what did you do, for some of you that was a long time ago, what did you do with your first wages? First money you got from working with your own sweat, what'd you do with it? Tell the person next to you. I think I went out. I just spent money on myself, rather than actually bless my mum who gave me everything. But what about you? Well, I had to give it to me. Because I had to give it back to her straight away to her mum. You know, when, oh, when I started working, it was three pounds a week. 
Can you believe it? I am patient for two pounds a week. Oh my okay. word. I, had, I think I had to give up at one pound. No, at at one 18 pound years old? 16. Oh my word. Come back to me for a second. Okay. Celebration. Fest. <laughs> I got so many more in here. It's really good. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, <laughs> here we go. I'll wake you up tomorrow morning, son, with one of these. It's going to be fantastic. Let, let, me let me tell you. Let me tell you. So I've just learned here that one of our elders, when he was 16, was paid three pounds a week. <laughs> oh, inflation is sweet, isn't it? Had to give it straight back to his mum. There is a godly couple here, a particular, particular deacon. I asked this deacon. I asked his wife. Obviously, you start with the wife first. More godly than a man normally. Um, what did you do with your first wages? I bought Tim a coat. Isn't that lovely? Isn't it? I then asked the husband. <laughs> bought a crate of beer. No. That's not what he said. He said, I paid an installment on the mortgage. Wow. It's good, isn't it? It's good, isn't it? Here's why we think those are sensible things to have done. Because when Tim did that, paid his first installment on his mortgage, he did it because he believed that first fruits, the first wages, were going to be followed by more. Are you with me? Caroline, perhaps, I venture to say, go out on a limb, would never have bought the man a coat if she thought that was the only money she was going to get paid. Although she does have a very good heart, I could be wrong. <laughs> Here the Israelites, look at it, bring to the priest a sheaf of the first grain they harvested. In the land that God was going to bring them to, Receiving God's provision and being grateful. But not just grateful. Grateful in anticipation, with faith, God would provide the rest of the harvest. Perhaps you know someone who is grateful in your life. Is there someone who is grateful in your family? Are you? Do you always say, thank you, Daddy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mommy, for cooking. Oh, very good. Interesting. Perhaps you have that person in your family. The thing is, picture the Israelites. Each time it rains, they worship the Lord. Each time the sun shines, they worship the Lord. Each time they glean a bit more of the harvest. They sow, they reap. Each time they store in barns. What is it that floods their hearts? Not thoughts of how they will spend it. Gratitude to the God who provides. For us New Testament Christians, each time we receive our paycheck, we go to work, we eat a meal, we go grocery shopping, each time we tithe, gratitude before the God who provides. We can forget this, can't we? You're all here. You all live in Walton or near Walton. You're all rich. So you can forget. It wasn't your own might and strength that brought you the provisions you have. It was the Lord who ordained the universe in such a way that you would have what you have. And so we ought to be grateful. But where is Jesus? In one minute and ten seconds. I believe this feast points to Jesus' says. Resurrection. So if Jesus was killed at Passover, the third day after that, when he rose, would be his resurrection on the third day, the day after the Sabbath. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 20, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits, festival of first fruits, of those who have fallen asleep. What's the point? First fruits in anticipation of what's to come. We look at Jesus being raised by God the Father and Jesus says the same will happen to you if you trust in me. At this feast, we look at Jesus, the first head of grain. And we look at our aching joints, our aching bodies, 
and we go, this is, this is not the end. God's great design, God's great plan is that I ought to be as Jesus is in his resurrection body. And I trust in him, knowing this will happen. It will come. It is certain. That is our hope and joy. That's why in verse 14, you read it with me. This is to be a lasting ordinance for generations to come. Wherever you live, whatever stage of life, whatever age, you know this is certain. The Lord Jesus has rescued you at Passover, taking your punishment that you deserved. He removes our sin and sanctification until he's finished with us, festival of unleavened bread. And he is the one who is the first fruits of a resurrection to come. And that is our certain hope. We will talk about the other feasts um, another Sunday. But let's pray together and thank the Lord Jesus that this is what he has done. Lord Jesus Christ, we are so thankful to you because we only have uh, the, the courage to admit that we are imperfect, that we can't please you, that we need you. We can only admit those things because we see your faithfulness, your great covenant heart, that you went out to rescue us, leaving nothing behind, sacrificing all so that we would know not only are we rescued and it's certain, but you, we are a work in progress that you have promised to finish and that we celebrate each of these truths. And we pray that you would help us please not to forget it. Any of what we have is given to us by your bountiful hand and we praise you. Help us now to sing wholeheartedly to you. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.